All right, we are live. Hey everyone, thanks for joining the webinar today. Uh, my name is Chris Grushi, and I am the president and co-founder of Convictional. And I'm joined here uh, by Alex Green, the CEO and founder of Picky Story. Uh, we're really excited about the conversation that we're gonna have today. We're gonna cover a lot of topics, including uh, cross-selling products from other brands. And so we're gonna talk about how to identify if these opportunities are right for your brand or, or your retail store. We're gonna talk about how to find complementary brands to engage in cross-sells or upsells with. And we're gonna talk about how to add them to your store, so a little bit more tactically, and how to measure success. Um, Alex and I also have a bunch of examples that we think are pretty fun to look at on how brands either could be doing this successfully or are currently doing this successfully. And so uh, we'll get into all of that. Uh, but first, um, I just wanted to take a moment to quickly introduce ourselves. Um, I will begin by just quickly sharing what we do at Convictional. So um, Convictional, we basically help retailers and brands uh, onboard and integrate with other brands and vendors. Now, the reason that retailers and brands would use us is to grow. They wanna grow without inventory, they want to expand their product assortments online, uh, and they ultimately wanna do this with less risk and cost. Um, and so, you know, that's really what we do. There's a lot of technology and infrastructure and expertise behind the scenes that makes that happen. But this is very complementary to what, Alex, you guys do at Picky Story. So. I'd love to hear more about your story and um, and and what your product does. Yeah, for sure. So first of all, thanks, uh, Chris, uh, for having me here. And hi, everyone. Um, so as Chris mentioned, my name is Alex. Um, basically, at Picky Story, um, what we do, we're building a mer fully merchandising platform for B2C stores, which means that we're trying to help merchants to increase their AOV by just selling more products together in multiple different scenarios that we constantly learn and implement in stores automatically. Could be bundles, could be cross-selling, could be upselling, uh, post-purchase, pre-purchase, any type of scenario that you can think of in order to just enhance the experience of the shopper. So basically, in, you know, together with Convictional and Chris, um, we can basically tell you, I think, a more enhanced, more rich story about how you can think about your brands, how you can think about selling more products and increasing your ROI, increasing your AOV, depends how you look at it. And, and just better to create a better, you know, cash flow for yourself, increase the revenue and lower your acquisition costs. So I think all of these kind of stuff we can we can discuss in, in, in our conversation today. You know, I'm sure it will be fun. Awesome. I think uh, there's there's a few topics we should get into here, Alex. Um, and you know, one of them is about what bundling, bundling products from other brands could do for a business. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'm happy to start with that. But basically, what we see is to grow uh, a brand. You know, a, a brand should think about one or more of the following tactics, and these these are very theoretical and full. But let's just lay it out from first principles, right? The first is to spend more on customer acquisition, right? You've got this great product, this converting online store, uh, things are going well, and then now you just need to drive more customers to the site. So we spend a little bit more money on Google, Facebook, Instagram ads, uh, and we see what the impact of that is. The second option is really to bring existing customers back free purchases. This is, depending on how you do it, one of the most profitable ways to grow because you already have the trust with that customer uh, and likely have a call to communicate with them with that you own, right? Say via email or even SMS, which is becoming more popular. And lastly, uh, you know, it's it's to, you, you know, another tactic is to increase the average order value of the carts that are being created on the site. Um, now, I think we as convictional bias uh, a little bit more towards two and three, right? And the reason for this, just in talking to uh, retailers and brands, is that it's no longer cheap to buy ads continuously uh, and drive you know, either uh, linear or, or say exponential growth to their brand through uh, 
through some of these paid channels. They need to kind of explore creative ways uh, to grow share of wallet um, and to get more efficient as businesses. <laughs> We're also seeing this play out in terms of VC markets too. Convictionals raised venture capital. We've raised about $50 million to date. And there's also a lot of, and we're a software company, right? Which makes sense. But there's a lot of D2C brands of the prior vintage uh, that have taken on a lot of capital and use that to grow. Uh, and that may have worked out for a period of time, but the tides seem to be churning due to various macro related changes. Um, and so the goal here of like cross-selling and bundling is to drive growth and expansion of existing and new customers who uh, enter the purchasing funnel on your e-com store. And so, you know, our platform really deals with the onboarding and integration of those brands and products. And then Picky Story, as far as I understand, your platform can bundle those products together. But I'm curious, Alex, like, what are you seeing in terms of how average, you know, order value is impacted by these types of use cases that we've been talking about yeah, so far? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that you hit a very interesting point. And, you know, when, when we were just kicking off this conversation and we were talking a little bit about, like, the why, like, why, you know, AOV is so important, why cross-selling up is so important. And maybe even before, you know, I'll get into you know, why I think it's, you know, it's important what I see, um, I think that it's still relatively not a very quick go-to of many brands. Like still many brands prefer going the acquisition path because I think for people, at least at the beginning, it's easier to understand the concept of you want to make more money, you bring more people into your store. It, the, the, the concept of actually under, understanding what are you, you know, what, how your customers are shopping, you know, what they're interested in and how you can enhance their experience. It, it seems to people in many cases a bit harder and not so intuitive as bringing just more people because we saw that, you know, I'm bringing people, they're buying. So let me just bring more people. And I think that you hit a very interesting point that you talked about D2C and capital and, and software and, and companies like us and capital. I think this game actually, you know, it changes for everyone, not only for D2C, stores, we see that, you know, this trick of just bringing a lot of capital in, spending it very, very aggressively on ad channels and getting, you know, all this demand constantly in and, you know, just throwing the cash, putting a lot of money into it and getting a lot of demand. I think this game slowed down for sure and even stopped in some in some industries, some cases, especially for D2C, because, you know, we, we saw what happened in Facebook with iOS 14. We saw what happened you know, on the competitive bids out there, it just gets, you know, more and more expensive. So when we when we started thinking about, okay, so what's next, right? How do we grow a business, right? If we cannot constantly spend more and more cash, but we need constantly to increase the number of purchases because at the end, it's not about how many people I'm getting in, it's about how many purchases I'm able to get, right? And the formula changes, it changes from, okay, person equals purchase to person can equal basically several purchases, but how do I do it? Right? So it's, 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 it's hard. First of all, it's, a con it's not hard, but it's challenging for, for emergent in terms of a concept emergency to understand how to think about it. And I think that's why we're here as well. And, um, and then the tooling, right? Because we, we can talk a lot about concepts and, and the theory is very rich, but how do I actually do it? How do I actually take my store and implement some of these strategies tomorrow? So in our case, we see that the most successful brands out there in the market are the ones who are constantly obsessed about increasing the revenue that they're generating per customer. And not only on the first session and the second session, but they constantly look at the lifetime of every customer. And I think this is really the big, uh, the big angle and, and the most important angle that we discuss here. Like, how do I start? You know, how do I switch my mindset from acquisition to uh, activation and maybe even increasing the value of every customer? How do you? It think is. About it? Well, I mean, it is amazing. And by the way, I'm just turning my video off because I think my Wi-Fi uh, is a little slow. So hopefully, this helps uh, and the audio is clear. Um, but, uh, you know, how, a, how a retailer, how a brand measures themselves, uh, in sort of like a post COVID post zero interest rate world, uh, really changes. 
And I think that requires a bit of uh, tooling, retooling of how these businesses operate. Um, so you talk about, Alex, you know, the importance of uh, revenue per customer. That is such an important metric. When you, know, you have unlimited funding or access to capital, you can paper over revenue per customer by essentially filling a bucket of more customers. But what happens is inevitably there are going to be leaks in that bucket. And so this business that you know was growing really well on paper may not actually have the sustainability of being able to operate in a world where access to capital is no longer abundant. Um, and so, you know, there's different there's different versions of metrics, right? Like one, you could also look at margin dollars versus margin percentages. Um, and so, you know, looking at retail specifically, retailers, uh, you know, have basically been, um, you know, trained to think about margin percentages. How can they make the most points of margin on a product that they sell on their online store? And to do this, they buy like a bunch of inventory to lock in the best price from a supplier. The trade there is, as a, as a retailer, I'm taking on more risk by buying inventory. Therefore, my supplier is giving me more points of margin. Um, but if you're not fully confident that you're going to sell all of that inventory uh, because of reasons we've talked about previously, demand is changing, um, customer acquisition costs are more expensive than ever, then it's like, okay, how do we de-risk this for ourselves? If you're measuring the business based on margin percentages, well, you're probably going to be disappointed if you change to a zero inventory model like Dropship or Marketplace. And we can define what those look like. Um, but I, th I think it is interesting because there's a little bit of change management involved whenever you introduce a new me metric with these teams. And it sounds like revenue per customer is one of the main ones we should be thinking about. So I guess I'm curious, Alex. Um, you know, if we just dive into tactics, right, away from theory to your point, how can a team identify the best pr uh, products and brands that their customers would purchase either in a bundle or through an upsell campaign? Um, how should we be thinking about that? Yeah, so that, that's probably one of the most common questions that we're getting every day, because a lot of people, they heard that they need to do it. They need, you know, they need to bundle products, they need to upsell, they need to cross sell. Really, where do I start? So in many cases, really, you, you can go the algorithmic type of path, uh, which we also offer in Picky Story. But I think it's one way. I'm not sure this is the best way right away for especially small to medium sized stores. But I, I can give you a couple of tips right away of how you can think about it, like what it means to sell products together. The first rule is that it, it should make sense, not to you. That's a big mistake, but to the shopper. If it doesn't make sense to the shopper, it won't work for you for the long run. Okay, so maybe you can you can sell a couple of products together if you'll push them you know hardly with discounts, but it's not it's not a strategy. And so that's the first rule. The first rule is that it should enhance the experience of the shopper. If it doesn't do it, it won't work. Second, a lot of people think about selling products together. And what I'm saying, what I'm saying. Selling products together could be any type of strategy, like upsell, cross sell, bundle. Like for the for the sake of the conversation, any strategy that you know at least sells two products together. The second rule is that you know selling products together doesn't mean that you need to discount them. That's something that many many people, um, I don't know why, but you know they assume that if you want to sell several products together, you need to discount them right away because otherwise, why would they buy? They would buy it if you will follow rule number one, which means it should make sense together. It should enhance the experience. Now, if you follow these two rules, that first, it should make sense together. Two, it's not always about discounting. Don't think about it as a discounting, as a promotion, but think about it as a long-term strategy. Then you can start thinking about different uh, approaches to selling products together. I would say that the first one, the, the initial, the most basic one, is just to look at your orders and see, okay, what usually, which products are usually being sold together? Like what might shoppers prefer to buy together when I don't ask them to buy together? They just do it because it makes sense for them by nature, right? Like, I don't know, buying t-shirt, you, you people pair it with the jeans. I see that there are certain, you know, two, three, four, five, ten items that are constantly, frequently bought together. You see this in your orders. Try to offer them 
and together. You can do it on your product pages, you can do it on collection pages, you can do it as bundles, as upsell, cross sell, whatever. So that's one thing. Another thing that many people do, and you can think about it right away, is products that complement each other, not only because they make sense you know, together, but just because it could be a good deal for the customer. For example, let's say that you have a new, there's a new season for the sneakers that you're selling, and you have some stock, some inventory from you know previous season. Now you really want to push the items that you still have in stock, but you have also some really really good new items that you just brought to your store, and you know you want to showcase them. So you can bundle these two products together, like your hero product or a product that is really shiny and a lot of people want, and you can basically bundle it together with a less good of a selling product in order to push them together. And there, for example, a discount can, can do the job and really push the shopper to get two sneakers instead of one. And you will get rid of the inventory and still make some decent amount of, of dollars. There are a lot of other strategies that you can that you can think of. You can think about promotions that make sense with holidays, right? So in some cases, you wanna, you know, there's a holiday season, there's you know, women women's international day. A lot of, if you open the calendar, there are a lot of different reasons why to promote something and, 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 do, and you know, sell it together. In, in, in other cases, you can also think about what my shoppers need, right? And one of the examples that I think we would like to discuss here is, for example, coffee, right? If, you, if you're buying coffee beans or a coffee machine, you need beans, right? So instead of letting your customer going to another store, and purchasing the beans or the complementary product in a different store, leaving his you know, good money there, maybe you can do something in your store, even though it's not your inventory or it's not your product. Like originally you're not selling beans, but you can do some kind of a collaboration with another store. And I think this is something that really you know gets back to convictional and, and what you guys are doing, right? And Chris, in, in terms of how you can collaborate I mean, you can think about different strategies for bundles, upselling and cross-selling, but in many cases, you don't really have the products to do it and you're getting stuck. But I think you, you, you can you know, share some light on how you can do it and what are the different strategies of getting complementary products when you really don't have that right away in your inventory. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and by the way, like you hit on so many great tactics there that I just want to highlight a couple of them before uh, before we yeah. jump ahead. The, the you know, I, I love this idea of looking at the at enhancing the customer experience as the cornerstone of the thing we're trying to do here. Right. It's not discounts. You know, in fact, if we take care of the customer, revenue will come. Right. The score will take care of itself. So. I love this idea that you shared on looking at historical orders to try to associate your products with complementary products. Um, there's a bunch of other uh, tactics that we would recommend a brand or a retailer do in order to drive, uh, you know, a better customer experience. And let's just take some easy ones, right? Like we've all been in cases where we've been shopping uh, for, let's just say, I don't know, a pair of shoes, and we go to select the variant uh, and the shoe that we want, and the size is no longer in stock, right? Or uh, you know, you could take a different example, right? But usually this is a terrible experience. I've in some cases have purchased a product that says it was available only to find out and get an email from customer support that actually that yeah. item's on back order, which means they don't have it in stock and I'll get it at a later point in time. And there is nothing more frustrating than that, right? Um, so what can brands and retailers do to prevent this kind of strategy or, or you know, even just enable cross-selling to fill some of these gaps? What we'd recommend is to look at search uh, their search results, right? Look at what people are searching for on your online store. 
Uh, and then you'll get an idea of not only how they associate your brands with different keywords or potential SKUs that they think live on your site or they think should live on your site, but they'll also give you clues around uh, the types of products you should be merchandising or that could be complementary. So, you know, not only looking at order history data, which was a fantastic suggestion, Alex, but also look at your search data um, to see where null searches are coming up for customers. And one of the other uh, points here is uh, you made is around merchandising. I love this. Um, historically, merchandising has been based on category, right? Men, women's, uh, you know, fashion, footwear, accessories, right? Think of like the major dropdowns that you would find on any generic e-commerce site. With the right kind of brand partnerships in a cross-sell, upsell fashion, you can start to merchandise around occasions, trends, and feelings, right? This is really cool. So you mentioned uh, like a Mother's Day event campaign. I love that. I think what prevents people from doing that is having the capability to onboard the right brands to be able to turn around those types of campaigns quickly. You could look at trends like sustainability. Lots of brands are trying to get into zero waste, uh, you know, sort of earth focused and green brands. Um, and so having sustainability focused products uh, as part of your assortment uh, that are organized intelligently around sustainability can be a great way to align yourself with the values of your customers. And the last thing, which I think is pretty cool, is merchandising around feelings. So we see customers merchandise around, you know, cozy or like morning routine or wellness, right? Or comfy. Uh, or like chilling out, like these types of feelings are what people try to achieve every day. And you can insert your products and other brands products in these types of feelings through just smarter merchandising and better brand uh, partnerships. So anyways, just wanted to chime in on a few recommendations because I loved the suggestions there, Alex. Um, you asked, uh, you know, if a brand has basically identified the Brit, the products right? The, the brands that they want to work with, how should they actually go about doing this? Um, so I think like there's different business models that they should attempt. Um, you know, the traditional method would be like, let's buy a bunch of inventory and see what happens. But again, we're trying to like do this in as efficient of a way possible and manage our cash flow intelligently. Um, you can try drop shipping from those brands. In the world of Shopify, as an example, dropship actually has a negative connotation. Right, we associate it with cheap products from like AliExpress that will take four to six weeks to arrive, and that's not conducive to a great customer experience. Um, but what if we could use this idea of like virtual inventory in a very curated way, where the brands we bring on board are trusted, they have a high quality product, and they can ship quickly? That's where I think you can start to. Uh, not only free yourself from the typical risk that would come with taking on inventory, but also tap into uh, the benefits of a of a curated marketplace or dropship program. Um, what you'll want to then do after you've decided kind of the business model is use uh, a tool that'll connect to the brand uh, and their system of record for inventory and products. Um, and typically, these brands would also use something like Shopify, right? Or they're using WooCommerce or Magento uh, or Salesforce, or they have like an ERP. And, you know, what I wouldn't recommend is brands go out and build integrations custom into these types of e-commerce platforms. Just use something off the shelf. Um, like Convictional has these connectors so that brands who want to partner with other brands can onboard and integrate them in a single click. Um, and in doing so, right, the, 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 su the supplier that you're onboarding or the other brand can start to sync their inventory, uh, send product information like images um, and descriptions. And that all comes to your doorstep so that you can start to merchandise those products in some of the cool, intelligent ways that we just talked about. So that would be like the high level playbook for how to think about this. Alex, anything else? Say once a brand, you know, has brought on, uh, once a brand has brought on uh, other products from a third party, they're starting to think about curating it. Anything else that you would recommend that they do as best practice? Yeah, so maybe we can, you know, jump right away into, okay, let's say that we identify the patterns Right, we identify the products. We identify, we know what we want to, you know, bundle, cross, sell, upsell together. Right, a lot of 
no, the, the next big milestone, the next big rock that you need to figure out is, okay, I have them, I have the ideas, I have the, you know, I have the pictures, I have the product, I have the inventory, I have the collaboration with another brand, two, three brands, whatever. Now I need to actually start merchandising it on my store. How do I do it? And, you know, what's the most important thing to start with? Do we have some kind of uh, can fails? You know, what is the strategy? What is the tactic? So there are really a couple of things that you should take into account when you start merchandising, you know, products together and, and combining them together. And I would start with the first very classical tactic, but super effective. And one thing that you should follow from the beginning is that people, they know or I mean, shoppers, when they come to your store, they're already familiar with, you know, your shopper, with your shop and, you know, with the shopping flow, with the structure of your store. They know how, you know, they know that they have the homepage, then they have the collection, that they have the product pages. Like this is the regular classical structure of the store. So try to flow with it. Try to create deals or offers that won't take your shoppers to a new type of experience. I'm talking about behavioral experience but try to include it already in the natural flow that they're already used to. One, one thing that you can do right away is to create bundles as products, right? Let's say that you are selling swimwear and you wanna sell you know, tops and bottoms together and you have like 30 pieces, 30 potential bundles that you would like to create. So instead of trying to show multiple products everywhere, just create these bundles as products. So you can use different tools like Picky Story, like other tools that will help you to really combine these child products, the top and the bottoms, the products that you actually wanna sell into one product, showcase them as a regular product in your store with a picture, you know, you have the pictures, you have the, the child products shown in one click of a button, one APC button, like on any other uh, page that you have there and create a collection of these bundles and put it out there. Usually people put it on the menu because they really want to highlight it. So people can come to their homepage, see it right away, like bundle and save, or here's a pro, you know, summer promotion. I like the example, Chris, that you said about feelings. Feelings is always one of the best angles to sell, right? We're selling something that, you know, beliefs, sustainability, green, you know, um, healthy coffee, healthy food, and right. I don't know, cotton, cotton based swimwear, whatever, right? You know your brand better, but you can highlight it. And then people can come, they won't see anything. They will see the same structure. They will see a lot of products. To them, it looks like products. They click on it, but instead of seeing only one piece, they will see two, three, four items. They just click on, on the bottom, on their, you know, bottom that they, they know it, they're used to it. It's one click of a button and they add multiple products to their cart right away okay so instead of selling them one piece you're selling them two or three pieces with one click of a button same experience you don't change anything so i think that's one thing keep it natural okay if you start creating um i would say new type of structures some sometimes too much creativity with you know the structure and how things look like could actually do the opposite of helping you could ruin your conversion rates it could, because people, you know, if they are not really, they're not feeling comfortable with, you know, some kind of a page structure, it's too much, too many, too much, you know, imagery, too much text, the bottoms are weird, too many clicks that they need to go through. They don't understand how the page is structured. It might be beautiful, but it won't work. So keep it as simple as possible. I think that's one thing. Now think about, the places where you actually want to enhance the experience. So we discussed collections. Collections are great because you can create products, put them in collections, dedicate collection, mix it with an existing collection. It looks like products, it's great. But what about some people won't go to this collection. Some people won't explore this collection. They won't see it, they won't get it. 1,000 reasons why not. What else can you do? Think about the natural behavior that your shoppers or any, almost any shopper out there that they're taking throughout the journey in your site, right? Usually shoppers are coming, you know, to your homepage or some kind of a more top of the top of top of level page, and they're getting funneled throughout the journey to your product page. Your product pages 
are a crucial point where you should, you must, it's really, that's what I'm saying to all of our customers, you must make sure that your product pages enhance the experience of your customer because that's your best conversion point in your store. If you're only off, now think about that. We call it dead ends. In many stores, you're getting to a dead end on the most important page, which is the product page. Like you're getting to a product page, the customer, you know, looks at the at the piece. Let's say it's a single regular product, and then the customer decides not to purchase it. I don't know because does you know he or she they, they didn't find the color, the size, the material, whatever, and that's it. The experience ends. Now, in order for them to continue exploring your website, they need to actually go and click on another page. They need you know to find new intent. Now, what we usually offer. And, and, and really recommend is to continue the exploration throughout you know, the page. So offer something to them, whether it's recommended products underneath uh, uh, the main product, whether it's a bundle, whether it's a, you know, a lot of people that view this product are also interested in, you know, in, in other products that are related to it. Like try to constantly get the shopper to the next experience try to constantly move the shopper towards the pages that make sense. It's the same idea that maybe you're familiar with, with content strategy, content funneling, right? When you're reading something, they're constantly trying, I mean, if it's a sophisticated place, newspaper, blog, right? They usually want to uh, get you to read more content, like YouTube kind of stuff, right? Explore more. Okay, you read about, um, you know, I don't know, uh, some kind of a cell that is going on, read about, you know, read, read something else that is related to it. Like continue your journey, continue the engagement. It's, 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 it's at the same importance for e-commerce as well. And unfortunately, not a lot of brands think about their stores like that. It's an exploration. Just your shoppers, they're not exploring throughout content. They're exploring throughout products. The product is basically your content. So if you think about your product as content, you constantly want to enrich it and connect the different pieces in a way that makes sense. So constantly your customers saw one piece of content. Okay, what is the next piece of content that is relates, you know, relates to it? And so that's what I'm saying. It's not only about showing all the products right away together. If you understand that there's some kind of, a, for example, again, swimwear that you're promoting, right? But there are other categories that might make sense with it. Make sure that your shopper, that your shopper sees a very easy button or experience to click through and see the other product. That's how you improve your um, your conversion. I don't know, Chris. Do what, what do you think? Do you have any other tips around like how to do it actually on the store? I, I gave a couple of basic ones, but. Maybe yeah, more. I actually I want to double click on shop the look specifically and how that works. Um, yeah. I think what you said around products as content really resonated with me, as well as this idea of uh, dead ends. Um, so I, I'm curious to hear more about um, how you think about shop the look specifically, because that's such a, an interesting way to merchandise products and product bundles. Um, you know, I, I think um, just even before getting to that, there's like, when you mentioned around uh, the example around swimwear, swimwear is is particularly interesting because we have this one uh, customer called Marisia and they sell, they're a brand that sells swimwear, but they came to Convictional to work with other brands in a very curated way um, to sell products other than swimwear. But that still makes sense with their aesthetic um, and with the type of content that they um, publish. And so now they've been able to selectively partner with brands uh, in categories such as beauty, um, in wellness. And then since then, they've expanded beyond swimwear. So they've really become, through this idea of cross-selling with other brands and building a lot of customer loyalty, a uh, destination of sorts for the types of products um, that their customers want to buy. Um, what we will also see there is like, um, if a customer, if a if a company sells a high price point product that does not is not conducive to recurring purchases, think like mattresses, bed sheets, furniture, right? 
what what brands will often do is think of like-minded and complementary brands that can drive recurring purchases. And I think that's such an excellent strategy to still get customers to, uh, in some cases, continue to hit their credit card and make purchases um, and delight them without even needing them to come back and check out, but also a way to drive customer lifetime value. So I, I love that idea as a strategy too of, of offering recurring um, products uh, as a way to drive lifetime value. But, you know, again, sh circling back to shop the look, um, say more about this. How does, how does this work with you guys? And, um, you know, when is this, uh, an appropriate strategy? Yeah, that's actually shop the look. It's a very interesting point. Just, I, I really like the, the comment that you made there about high price points and products that you, okay. These kind of stores, I think there are a lot of them. So I think it, it's worth to give it, you know, like one, two minutes to discuss it for a second, because we yep. see a lot of a lot of stores that are coming in and they have this one hero product that they're selling. Usually it's around electronics, bedding, like big things, furniture, like something big that you're selling, appliances, different different things that usually the hero pro product costs a lot. Sometimes one, like I would say one thousand, two thousand dollars plus. And then one of their main problems, as you said, is and a lot of them are coming and saying, I'm really focused on the first session. I'm really focused on bringing the customer to, the, to check out on, you know, as fast as possible, because I know that people, for example, they're not, this is something that I heard from one of the leading brands out there on the embedding. I need to sell the mattress and I'm trying to sell also the pillows and the linen and every, I mean, I try to sell everything at once. Because I know that the chances that this customer will come back and buy something, you know, another bed or another mattress in the near future is almost zero. So the strategy is like, let's sell, you know, whatever we can and, you know, skip to the next one, to, the, to go to the next customer. I think this is true, but it's not really a good strategy for the long term. Like, yes, we, you know, there's the first purchase that it's the meaningful purchase of the mattress or the bed or the robot or whatever you're selling on a high price point, your hero product, but not thinking about, as you said, not thinking about some kind of a recurring strategy, not thinking about accessories, not thinking about other products that you can complement and you can sell alongside your mattresses, for example, a cleaning set, right? If I'm buying a mattress, why? Uh, maybe I need a clean set. Maybe I need something else on a recurring basis. Maybe not every month, but maybe every quarter, right? Think about the small stuff that you can sell on a recurring basis, and this what will bring your revenue up. Now, if you will read some of the you know biggest researchers about about IKEA and how they do their business, you will see that most of the products that they sell. And the reason why they got to be to become such a big brand is because of the complementary products that sometimes we call the spontaneous shopping, not because of the products that, you know, their shoppers are coming originally to purchase in Ikea. So that's, I think, a good comment because a lot of a lot of brands that are selling one big product and sometimes a couple of small products, there are a lot of times they're frustrated because they really don't know what to do next. They sold the one product, they, you know, they, they, they already paid for the acquisition of this customer, but what's next? Like, what should I do? So that was just a comment about the one, you know, the hero product. Regarding shop to look, shop to look, it's really a lot of people associated with fashion only, but I would say that this is not true. Shop to look, it's basically the same idea of selling products together or selling a bundle. But instead of selling the products, you're selling the experience. And that's very, very important. I think brands, as they grow and mature, especially in their thinking, they're stuff that they're, you know, they don't think about, okay, how do I sell this product to as many people as possible? They think about, okay, what do I sell? And what is the experience? For example, one of our customers for Sigmatic, they're, you know, if you look at their product, they're selling coffee. Like a lot of brands are selling coffee, but they would never talk about coffee. They're talking about having, you know, a healthy type of work life balance. And they're selling healthy coffee for people who care about their, you know, health and about their uh, you know, lifestyle. So 
it's about selling the experience. I think that Shop the Look is a mature way of selling your brand. It's a tool that allows you, instead of selling a sofa and a chair, to sell your to sell the experience of a living room, of a modern living room, of a classical living room, right? You're showing to people how they will use your products in a certain environment and you sell the experience. Another great example that we have, it's, it's a really cool brand that we, we work with, Zenbivi. Zenbivi is basically um, uh, Michael, who's the CEO, but he sells is basically sleeping system, outdoor sleeping systems. He never said that he sells mummy bags, right? Or mattresses to go outdoor and you know have camping and all of that. That's not his brand. His brand is you are buying the experience of Zenbibi outdoors. So people talk about it. I have Zenbibi equipment. I have the, I, I bought the Zenbibi experience. I bought the mattress. I bought um, the tent. I bought the, mat uh, the, the pillow. And this is the experience. It's a full thing. And when you're selling the experience, you have the chance to showcase to your customers more product, but not in a salesy way of, you know, get this and get that and get not like type of Amazon style, which is very effective. But what, what we're trying to explain with Shop the Loop is that you're saying, okay, you want to look like this. You want to hang out there. You want to use uh, this kind of equipment. You want to live in this kind of a living room. Okay, so you're selling the experience to the customer if it makes, again, comes back to rule number one it should make sense to the customer. If it makes sense, you're showing an incredible experience. People buy with their eyes. They're not buying by you know, reading the technicalities and the materials of your product. I think that's really the big thing about Shop the Loop. It can be used almost in any um, industry, in any vertical, but you need to really think through what is the, ex that's the basic question. My brand, what is the experience that I'm trying to sell it's about what so i don't know did you have any experience with shop to look and from your customers chris i mean um so many uh interesting points there uh i love shop the look because ultimately the customer can see themselves using the product in a context um, so it's not just an image on a white background. Uh, it's an experience that they can relate to. Um, you know, I'm visiting right now Austin, Texas. I'm normally from Toronto. Um, Austin, Texas is a wonderful city. Um, and I believe it is the birthplace of the brand Yeti, uh, which is uh, a brand everybody, uh, most people I would say are familiar with, uh, very successful. One thing that strikes me about Yeti is just how uh, uh, relatable they, their product is to uh, outdoor activities, right? To, to living in the, or to being part of an outdoor experience, um, camping, uh, you know, whether it's being on a boat. And so like, these are all things, or, or hiking, um, these are all things that like people love to experience. And when you think of those experiences, you may associate those experiences with Yeti uh, and certainly their e-commerce, uh, uh, you know, pushes that narrative. So let's get back to maybe cross-selling a little bit here. You know, it sounds like Alex, it has to start from a place of a good customer experience. Um, do you have any um, tips for how brands can measure the success of cross-selling? What are some of the metrics that stores need to monitor? I have a few ideas here, but I'm curious what comes to mind for you as far as metrics go. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll start. And I'm actually curious to hear your ideas as well. Because I'm sure that it's 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 it's, a, it's not an easy it's not an easy test. Um, I would say that if it's cross selling, you know, within you know, your store with your own products without collaborating, I would say that you need to constantly first of all measure the revenue or to, or to try to split and measure the revenue of the previous experience where you know you just sold the people that bought product A. Now you're, you know, cross-selling it with other products. What was the journey, right? How much, what was the average value of the people who bought this product before you started cross-selling it with other products? 
And then I would probably check also what happens after you started also pushing it with other products, cross-selling with other products. Now, in many, th in many in cases, you need to think about also cannibalism a little bit of your own you know, purchase uh, journey. So you need to make sure that you're not pushing the things that people will buy anyway, or usually they buy together and just to push it because it's easy, try to find things that make sense, but adding the extra thing, like the extra item will actually increase on average the value of this session of this you know, journey. It's not easy to measure. We're working also on a lot of tools in order to make it easier to understand, like how do you need to measure it? But overall, I think the easiest way is just to measure the AOV, right? Like what happens when I had sessions without this new cross-selling experience that I'm now pushing, you know, with my, with my store, what was the average value of the order, right? You can also split it, of course, into, you know, products that you kept single and products that you tried to push together with others and then measure it again, measure again the AOV after you're trying to, um, and push it together with other products. I think the easiest way is just to compare AOVs over different periods of time. So for example, like last week and this week, the last two weeks, this two weeks. Um, and that's probably would be my, you know, would be my best tip here. Other things that you can do um, is also you can think about drivers. In many cases, one product is really the hero product of the store. Right. Actually, in most cases, I would say every store has like one to three products that really sell well and everything else is, you know, sells, but here and there. You can start building strategies that are based on, OK, we want people to buy the hero product and then what? Then let's try, you know, to combine it with product A then try to combine it with product B and then measure one week let's run with product a one week let's run with product b and see if the aov increases and how much it increases so you can maybe the second tip is try to split your tests into the smallest possible test that you can do like do one thing at a time define it well write to yourself what is the expected outcome from this measure and write it down and do the next one. Don't mix a lot of combinations right away on the same path because otherwise it will be very, very hard um, to measure it. What do you think, Chris, from your side? How do you do it? Well, you make a good point about knowing the before before you can measure the after, right? So um, if we want to look at this as a you know cross-selling specifically as a long-term viable strategy for growing uh, our brand, our company, um, we need to know what the impact will be. And so having a baseline to compare to is a fantastic point and very easy. And, and for lots of folks here um, and others, they can pull that from their existing reporting from their e-commerce platform very easily. So, okay, so now you have your before, you have your baseline. Um, where do we go from here? There's a few things that I think uh, brands could do in order to measure success or failure of this. Um, one strategy for measuring that we would recommend is what we would call skew productivity. That is a fancy way of basically saying, set yourself a target of revenue that you want to hold this new skew that you've onboarded through convictional and now picky story um, accountable to, right? So you pick a revenue target um, and you know that would that revenue target, you're convinced if you hit it, uh, say a certain amount of GMV within a month, it would make sense to continue having that SKU on your site uh, because you don't want SKUs on your site that aren't generating any revenue. You want to hold those SKUs accountable to some amount of revenue. So that level, that minimum level of revenue is what we would call SKU productivity. So, um, you know, you would look at measuring this over a monthly period, say it's like $10,000 worth of GMV, if that SKU generates ten thousand dollars worth of GMV, great, you know, and and it impacts our average order value, great. 
let's consider uh, maybe adding another product or another brand to our uh, cross-selling uh, campaigns. The second metric that you might want to look at is how customers engage with the bundle or the new product um, through customer-specific campaigns. So we love this idea of testing and learning how customers will respond to these types of products. One very simple way to do this is to create private collections of these bundles or uh, you know, unique merchandising uh, pages and only offer those private collections or the link to those collections to email and SMS subscribers. So you're effectively rewarding your email and SMS subscribers with cool products that they can't find on the site that are generally available, right? They're hidden only for subscribers. And so um, that is a great way to bring them back to uh, look at what's new and exciting and to engage with the email. And it provides data as to whether these types of uh, subscriber only campaigns uh, and products make sense for your most loyal customers. And obviously, we can't just measure click throughs and uh, add to carts and things like that. We ultimately want to measure sales, right? So we want to measure did this lift AOV? And did this actually lead to more revenue and hopefully an increase in conversion rate? So these types of campaigns that you offer specifically to your most loyal subscribers can be a great way to compare um, the before and after. So those are just a couple of tips that come to mind, Alex. I, um, I really like the idea, by the way, of private collections. I would also add landing pages. A lot of customers yes. are doing the tests on landing pages, like closed landing pages. And then they bring like dedicated traffic to these landing pages. I think that, you know, rewarding SMS, you know, subscribers and email subscribers, it's a great idea. Maybe even running a small ad campaign to these pages, lock them in this environment and see if it actually makes sense or not. Like you could do really small scale campaigns to test whether these products make sense together. If you see sales goes up, you might even include them in your, you know, on your main website. Right. Yeah. Like you could do the landing page uh, test before you even onboard the product. Now, yeah. customers might be disappointed because they, <laughs> you may not have a product there to sell them, but if there's intent, that's a clear indication that you will convert that traffic um, once you have a shoppable product uh, onboarded. Um, fantastic suggestion. Um, and also a great way owners to get started to test in their in their uh test their online stores and new markets um uh alex um this has been a really wonderful conversation uh i i think maybe we should just open it up to the audience to see um if there are questions uh that we should answer from the audience here if not we can keep going but we do have about eight minutes left um before we wrap up so I'll just yeah. pause here would be happy to see if you know if we can answer some questions here All right. It looks like we have one uh, from Nikhil. What are promotion strategies that brands can implement together to maximize cross-selling across their audiences? Ooh, this is an interesting one. So it seems like the question asker is wondering how uh, campaigns and promotions can work together. Um, any ideas on that, Alex? It really depends. I think you know how you think about campaigns and promotions in the wider audience, but. I think that it basically connects back to what we what we discussed a little bit about landing pages. I think that if you start thinking about your products and on you know if you start thinking about onboarding products to your store um, as experiments as tests and you really create dedicated pages which you can duplicate of course and you test a lot of different variations and you come up with two three uh, variations that actually work you start implementing them throughout your website. I think that big thing that you will find very interesting, or maybe an idea that you will find very interesting is that in some cases, specific promotions can work amazingly on you know, a specific channel, but they won't work on a different channel. For example, sometimes showing, let's, let's take a very simple example, a bundle, right? Sometimes showing a bundle as a product in a collection can work very well because it has a lot of context from other you know products in the collection or you know the general flow 
But then when you're trying to push it to another product page, as you know, a bunch of products that you need to add with one click, it doesn't work. Or if you try to sell it, you know, with an email. I think there is no one rule that I at least can, you know, set for how to spread, you know, the promotion, how to how to promote it across your channels and you know to to to, to the audience throughout different you know channels or angles or tools. I would say that testing, testing, testing is the is the best way um to go. Start with one or I mean one option is to start with one place where you actually put the bundle and see if it works or put the you know the upsell cross sell. Another way to do it is like start with five versions. Five versions of different places. Try to get a signal like Chris said before, like get the CTR, see see how people engage with it and start removing it from places that are not working together. And try to build this kind of you know experiment flow over several weeks and get to, I don't know, three, four, five, six promotions that work well, each one of them on a different place. And then you're getting like something that makes sense. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Chris? Yep. Well, I, I, uh, it's interesting because I think there's some, maybe some controversy around whether brands should share customer data with each other, right? So if you're engaging in cross-selling, sometimes we get the question, hey, should I share uh, the email subscribers that I've built up or the customer data from these orders with my uh, suppliers, with my vendors? And I think that there are probably some uh, PII um, uh, concerns there that I would defer to the policies that you have in place between you and your vendors. Generally, I don't think that that makes sense. I think that the whoever is selling to the customer should own the customer data, um, and you know the brand who's fulfilling the order should get a very healthy margin um, for you know the increase in distribution. Now we have another question here, which I think is is super interesting. It's uh, how to make customers happy when shipping products, multiple products from different warehouses. So Alex, here's the scenario, right? We have this, uh, we have this, this bundle. One for you, Chris. This one's for me, but we have this scenario, right? Where we've got a, a product um, or, or a customer who adds multiple products uh, from different vendors to their cart. They check out, everything's great. They get tracking numbers. Um, what do we do about the fact that they're going to get two different packages or three different packages? Um, Here's my answer to this. It matters much less than people think. The reason it matters much less than people think is that we are uh, conditioned to have multiple packages from the same order arrive at different times thanks to Amazon. This happens all the time. The things that actually matter that we want to pay attention to with respect to shipping are the following. The cost of shipping to the customer, and the shipping speed, right? Those are the things that matter. Um, if it is very expensive to have a vendor uh, ship an item to the customer and they're passing the cost of shipping over to the customer, that might be prohibitive and therefore reduce conversion rates. So whoever is owning the customer and the channel needs to think through their shipping policy. Second, uh, you know, how should we measure um, ship, shipping rates? We do this in our platform uh, within Convictional. We measure ship times. And so what you'll want to do as the uh, brand who's selling to the customer is have a service level agreement in place, a policy with your vendors, right? So say you want products to be shipped within 48 hours. Um, that is very reasonable. And you should be able to hold your vendors accountable to that ship time policy. So we would give you the ability in the dashboard to see the average ship time from the vendors you choose to onboard to ensure that they remain in compliance with your ship time SLAs. So we talked about cost of shipping, make it free for the customer, make it easy for them to buy the product uh, and only partner with vendors who can ship products quickly. Those are the things that matter. Now, if the customer opens a box that's shipped from a third party vendor and it contains, you know, a, uh, uh, flyers for the for the vendor. It contains uh, maybe packaging that's not on brand, um, or a packing slip that doesn't look like it came from the from the brand who ultimately sold to the customer. Then those can be negative post purchase experiences. 
what we would recommend in these cases is to, at minimum, have your vendors ship the products in a, an unbranded box so that you know there's no promotional material from the vendor who's shipping it, um, and ensure that the packing slip is branded to the merchant who originally um, uh, got the order, right? So if you have branded packing slips, a neutral branded or no branded uh, uh, box, um, that can help the customer um, you know, the customer experience post-purchase. So those are those are a couple of um, tidbits that we would recommend. Again, multiple packages from different warehouses, less of an issue. The bigger issues are cost of shipping, shipping, shipping times, um, and misaligned packaging. But all of those things can be solved for uh, very easily. So um, yeah, those that would be my take. Uh, shipping times is definitely a big one. I think that shipping times are becoming more and more important. And misalignment also as well. Right? Yeah. Think a couple of good tips there. Right. We uh, we have one more and then we'll wrap up, which is how should we think about pre-purchase and post-purchase with regards to upselling? Um, Alex, any any quick thoughts on that? Yeah, because we don't have a lot of time. So I'll just uh, quickly note here. I think that the big it's, it's the big question, pre-purchase and post-purchase. I think that really splits nicely um, the experience of upselling and cross-selling before the checkout and after the checkout. I think that, you know, two quick things um, from my side, I think that pre-purchase before people get to checkout, it's all about enhancement. You need to enhance the experience and that's your goal. If you will be able to enhance the experience nicely in a way that doesn't interrupt the usual journey, you will be able to sell more product to more people and get your revenue up. And post-purchase to me, it's all about urgency. Post-purchase, you don't have a lot of time. The customer already made you know the payment usually they should they try to you know like run away from from the store as fast as possible because that's it you know the intent went down but your goal is to reignite the intent by offering a deal that they cannot refuse usually with it's a time limit deal usually it's with a really effective or you know significant discount and this is a very strong strategy, very effective if you do it right. So if I need to say, you know, what is the main difference and how you should think about it? Pre-purchase, it's about enhancement. Post-purchase, it's about urgency and making decisions fast because you already have the credit card. You already have all the details from the customer. They don't need to reinsert all the details again. They just need to click on the button, but in order for them to click on the button, it should make a lot of sense and be a really good deal. What do you think, Chris? Amazing suggestions. I think this is a phenomenal place to wrap up. Alex, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about uh, Picky Story and the wonderful tactics that you've recommended here on how to do cross-selling and upselling thoughtfully and ultimately successfully. Um, and really appreciate um, the audience questions that we received as well. We will be taking the content of this and sharing it widely. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Alex, and to our audience here. Uh, we hope that you partner thoughtfully and collaborate thoughtfully with other like-minded brands to grow, um, especially in this tough economy. Um, there's opportunity out there. You just have to find it and partner with the right brands who can complement your assortment. So thank you so much, Alex, and sure. we'll see you next time. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. And thanks, guys, for coming. It was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. All right. Me too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys.